Thank you all for joining our monthly webinar organized by our Instrumentation and Future Technologies Committee. Today's speaker is Elizabeth Wig from Stanford University. She will be speaking to us about using INSAR to measure how vegetation and soil moisture can change in dynamic environments. Elizabeth has been supported as a National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellow, a National Defense Science and Engineering Graduate Fellow, and a Stanford Graduate Fellow. We ask that you please hold your questions until the end. And with that, we look forward to your talk. So please take it away, Elizabeth. Thanks, Sean. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Wig, a PhD student at Stanford. And today I'll be talking about how we can use INSAR closure phase time series to measure changing moisture in soil and vegetation in radar images. Uh, for an outline of my talk today, I'll be discussing why soil and vegetation moisture are important for a couple of applications. I'll discuss how we can use a basic scattering model to infer the behavior of closure phase. Then I'll show how analysis with this model can enable us to estimate soil moisture from INSAR closure phase with some real data over the state of Oklahoma in the US. I'll briefly touch on a few insights into one of the more confusing aspects of closure phase for many people, uh, which is this so-called like systematic bias that results in short baseline interferograms seeing what looks like a bias in deformation. Uh, and finally, I'll discuss some preliminary results on measuring vegetation moisture from INSAR closure phase and on measuring vegetation and soil moisture at the same time. First up, motivation. Why measure vegetation moisture and soil moisture? The Global Climate Observing System has identified a number of essential climate variables that are important to observe and measure to understand Earth's climate. One that is well-defined is soil moisture in the hydrosphere. And then lying at the intersection of two essential climate variables, above ground biomass and fire is vegetation moisture, sometimes referred to as fuel moisture. With climate change comes droughts, floods, and extreme weather, in addition to temperatures creeping up. All of these factors can threaten crop yield in agriculture. Meanwhile, the amount of irrigation, ir the amount of irrigated acreage in the US has climbed over the past century, meaning that for those who manage water use, knowing all the variables is critical. In light of these issues, someone managing agricultural policy might ask questions like, how can I track how cropland is being used? Where are farmers irrigating and how can we irrigate more efficiently? How do drought and flooding affect agriculture at a local scale? There are lots of variables that go into making informed decisions about these questions, and some of them are listed above, uh, including crop biomass, crop moisture, soil moisture, and weather. Ideally, we'd be able to understand these variables at a variety of scales, from understanding each at the resolution of a single agricultural field on the order of a kilometer, but also being able to address these questions at regional and global scales. Um, that's one application where remote sensing can come in handy, both having the fine resolution and um, a very, can, it can have a very comprehensive coverage. Um, another such application where remote sensing can be useful is fire. Extreme wildfires have doubled in frequency and intensity in the past 20 years around the world. These fires can damage ecosystems and infrastructure, and they can be deadly, destroying homes and towns and causing poor air quality for people living in a much wider area surrounding the fires. So you can imagine, again, that people on the ground managing fires want all the information they can get. They might ask questions like, what areas are at greatest risk of burning? Where should I build fire breaks? Where should I set up controlled or preventative burns? We want to give them good information so they can make informed decisions about these topics. This kind of information could include fuel types and terrain in their area of interest, vegetation, fuel moisture, and soil moisture, and fire and smoke models, which themselves rely on the above variables as input. Um, again, today's focus is on measuring vegetation fuel and soil moisture, which can help fire managers figure out which places are likely to burn more quickly or severely. We can track soil moisture with radiometers like SMAP, but the resolution is coarse on the order of tens of kilometers. 
We can try to measure proxies for vegetation moisture using optical data, but it can't see through clouds or smoke. Therefore, we'll look to active radar data, which has a fine resolution on the order of meters and can see through clouds and smoke. In particular, I'll be talking about INSAR, or Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar. Um, this brings us to part two, where we'll derive a simple scattering model for INSAR closure phase, and we'll define closure phase. By taking advantage of platform motion to create radar images, Synthetic Aperture Radar, or SAR, achieves a higher resolution than passive radiometric measurements and more complete coverage than in situ measurements. Repeat pass interferometric SAR, or INSAR, is a technique in which a radar platform travels along the same path to image the same ground area at different times. The signals from the two passes are interfered, and the difference in phase of the return signal to the radar can tell us the amount of ground deformation that occurred between the radar passes. While this interferogram signal contains a phase associated with ground deformation, it also may contain phases from a number of other sources, including atmospheric and system noise, and from changing scattering properties on the ground, like changes in soil moisture and vegetation canopy moisture. INSAR closure phase is produced when we further interfere three interferograms from three radar passes in a loop. We calculate the net phase differences from time 1 to 2, time 2 to 3, and back around from time 3 to 1. In the case shown here, where the sole contributor to the interferometric phase is ground deformation, we expect the resultant closure phase to be zero. Adding the phases from time 1 to 2 and 2 to 3 exactly cancels the phase change from time 3 to 1. Similar signals that are simple results of path delay, such as atmospheric signals, will also result in a closure phase of zero. This scenario becomes more complex when we consider multiple layers of scatterers that can interfere with one another. For example, a radar imaging a forest may receive responses from both the tree canopy and the ground, and may also receive interfering signals from the soil surface and subsurface. This creates a scenario where the closure phase may no longer be zero. This non-zero closure phase can be a nuisance signal if you're trying to get accurate deformation measurements, but it also presents an exciting opportunity to measure soil and vegetation moisture exactly because the deformation and atmospheric noise signals are canceled out. We can visualize the non-zero closure phase by imagining that instead of the three simple arrows adding in a loop to represent deformation, we have contrib contributions to the lengths of the arrows from multiple scatterer populations as shown on the right. For example, here the sort of greenish uh, scatterer population may represent a surface while the brown might represent a subsurface, whether that's like tree canopy and ground or ground surface and subsurface scattering inside the soil. In the multi-looked image, the closure phase arises from this scattering interaction of the multiple layers as the signals from each interfere with each other, whether they be soil moisture below the ground surface or changing vegetation canopy above it. We can create a simple scattering model to demonstrate how this can happen. Um, don't worry too much about following every step of the math in these slides. I'm just showing that we can do it and it's simple enough to show on a slide. Um, we'll just use a two layer model um, where the layers are any surface and subsurface, soil or vegetation canopy. Um, we can derive the received echo and we're going to normalize the phase and the path delay to the return from the top surface. After normalizing the scatterer depth to the wavelength, we can calculate the return from two such simple echoes from a surface and subsurface, where the only difference between them is a changed dielectric constant of the medium, resulting from changed soil or vegetation moisture. We interfere these echoes to generate an interferogram. To model multi-looking, we take the expected value of the interferogram, assuming that we are doing enough spatial averaging for a stable statistical average. This has an added benefit of simplifying the modeled interferogram as many of the cross terms go to zero. We can then calculate the closure phase across three such interferograms where the dielectric constant changes in all acquisitions. <laughs> 
The important takeaway from this derivation is that to find the expected closure phase uh, in our model, all we need is the radar cross section of the medium and the dielectric constant of the medium. We can extend this by calculating the closure phase across all three interferograms where the closure dielectric constant changes in all acquisitions. Well, this equation expanding on the previous slide for closure phase is very long and you don't actually have to follow all of it. It is also still quite simple. Again, it only depends on the radar cross section and dielectric constant, and more specifically in the differences in dielectric constant from one time to another. Um, the next step we take in our process is to calculate a cumulative sum of this closure phase time series. Why would we want to cumulatively sum closure phase? An analogy can be found in interferometric phase. Changing elevation of the ground produces a non-zero interferometric phase corresponding to the changed position of the ground from one acquisition to another. To find displacement over time, this velocity can be cumulatively summed over a time series of sequential interferograms. Analogously, here we assume that time-varying dielectric properties of the Earth's surface produce a non-zero closure phase, which corresponds to the change in the dielectric properties. Because changes in moisture or other volume scatterers are related to closure phase, we cumulatively sum closure phase over time to derive a time series of soil or vegetation moisture. On the left is our model of dielectric constant as a function of soil moisture, and on the right we show an example time series of soil moisture. We assume rainfall events occur over a very small number of days, followed by a slow decay in soil moisture representing dry down. Next, we model generating closure phase triplets based on this soil moisture data and our previous mathematical scattering model. Then we'll see what happens when we take the cumulative sum of these triplets. On the left, we see the closure phase produced by our model for this soil moisture time series. You can see it has these negative spikes, unlike the original soil moisture signal, and even the peaks are not aligned in time with the peaks in soil moisture. On the right, we take a cumulative sum of the closure phase and we notice a trend. I'll discuss the source of this trend in a later part of the talk. It's related to the systematic bias many others have observed in closure phases. For now, we simply fit and subtract a line to detrend it. So once we have the solid line and we subtract the dotted line fit, what we get is this in red. I'm calling this the detrended cumulative closure phase. And we can see in blue the soil moisture time series. We've averaged the soil moisture values over the three days included in the closure phase triplet. And it's evident from this figure that the detrended cumulative closure phase is anti-correlated to the soil moisture, according to our model. Now let's see if we can use this relationship to estimate soil moisture. On the left, we scatter the detrended cumulative closure phase against the soil moisture, and we find that they have a correlation coefficient of negative 0.87. We find a consistent um, like regression line in black, and we use this regression to generate an estimate for the soil moisture. The estimate is shown on the right, and it appears to track the soil moisture fairly closely. Now let's see how well this concept works in some real data. Um, so to generate the real closure phases, we use a Sentinel-1 INSAR swath in central Oklahoma, multi-looked to a pixel size a bit smaller than a kilometer. We validate with 37 in situ soil moisture probes, taking daily measurements of soil saturation at 5 centimeter depth. We'll look at data over three years from 2018 to 2021. Here we can see that the interferograms across the first few dates in this time series contain a lot of signals, um, and they're mostly from atmospheric noise. There's not much deformation happening in this area over this time period. When we calculate the closure phase, the signals from the atmosphere and the deformation are canceled out around the triplet, leaving this more subtle closure phase signal. <laughs> 
We create a time series of sequential closure phase triplets, and then we'll calculate the cumulative sum of the closure phase over this time series. As in our model, we find that a cumulative sum of the closure phase results in a trend at nearly all sites. We once again fit a line to the trend and then remove the trend to find our detrended cumulative closure phase. Uh, I'll be going into depth about the rest of our process at one site in Seminole, Oklahoma. Without cumulatively summing and detrending the closure phase, it does not seem to have any obvious correspondence to the soil moisture, as we can see on the left. But when we take our detrended cumulative closure phase derived from INSAR on the right and compare it to soil moisture, we see a pretty clear anti-correlation between the two. This also seems to follow the model. So next, we'll try regressing detrended cumulative closure phase against soil moisture. The correlation between the two is negative 0.77 at this location, and we can see a linear relationship in these data points. We once again use this correlation to create a regression fit line in black, and then use this fit line to estimate the soil moisture values. Uh, so when we do that at this site, the prediction appears to track pretty closely between our measured and estimated soil moisture. It doesn't capture all the variation in the soil moisture data, but it does a decent job here. Now let's compare this to some other sites in our swath. Seminole is a, an example of a more clear linear relationship between detrended cumulative closure phase and soil moisture, but the Lahoma site on the left has a weaker relationship, and the Hinton site exhibits practically no relationship at all. When we use these fit lines to estimate soil moisture, we see that while the estimate at Seminole tracks the soil moisture closely, Lahoma's does less well, capturing the soil moisture in some places, but overestimating periods of low soil moisture. At the Hinton site, the estimate fails to capture the variation in soil moisture at all. So from here, we can ask a few questions. Um, one is, how does this compare to existing methods of soil moisture remote sensing like SMAP? Um, how can we tell which measurement is closest to the truth? Uh, another question is, how do we optimize this um, to get the best measurements we can across this whole area? And then a third question is, how well does this generalize? Can we use it to estimate soil moisture everywhere or at least everywhere within this region? So to compare to other measurement types, we use extended triple collocation. Using three independent sources of measurement, extended triple collocation can be used to estimate the correlation between each measurement source and the ground truth. Here, our three roughly independent measurements come from the SMAP radiometer, the in-situ soil moisture sensors, um, which use thermal measurements, and then the INSAR closure phase. Um, in aggregate, the triple collocation finds that the in situ measurements have a correlation coefficient of 0.83 with the true soil moisture signal, that SMAP has a correlation of 0.78, and that the closure phase measurements have a correlation of 0.59 with the true soil moisture. There's exactly one site where the closure phase measurements are a better match to the in situ data than the SMAP data is, and so I showed it here. Uh, while the match with the closure phase derived soil moisture is the weakest, closure phase still has advantages of higher resolution than SMAP, uh, meters rather than kilometers, and more full coverage than the in situ sensors. And this is still an early version of the closure phase measurements, so there's a lot of optimization that could still be done. As the first step at such optimization, uh, I looked at the effects of more averaging on the quality of fit between the closure phase and the soil moisture. The different colors correspond to different levels of spatial averaging of the INSAR data, while the x-axis shows temporal averaging of the soil moisture in situ data on days surrounding the central date in the triplet. Generally, more averaging improves the fit up to a point where the benefits start tapering off. Um, but now let's look at how consistent the regression fit lines are from one site to another.
We plot all the fit lines between the detrended cumulative closure phase and the soil moisture. Here, thicker lines indicate higher correlation between the closure phase and soil moisture. Then we'll take the average of all the well-performing fit lines and use this regression to estimate soil moisture from closure phase at all sites. We find that using every site's individual best fit, uh, we have a correlation coefficient between measured and estimated soil moisture of 0.36. When we use the universal fit line rather than one tailored to each site, our correlation coefficient is also 0.36. So while the average correlation with the in-situ data at all sites is not super high, trying to make this estimation process more uniform does not degrade the quality of fit. And when we look at only our top five best fitting estimates, we find that whether we use their individually tailored fit lines or this one size fits all line to estimate the soil moisture, the correlation coefficient also remains the same at 0.63. This is promising as it suggests that from site to site, the detrended cumulative closure phase behaves consistently, suggesting that it may be possible to come up with a universal rule describing closure phase at all locations, at least within a swath or kind of like region type, be it agricultural, be it forest, however. Um, and we can use our universal fit line to estimate soil moisture time series within the swath as shown here. Um, you can kind of see the seasonal changes in soil moisture um, in dry and wet seasons as this time series of soil moisture in the video progresses. Um, we also can kind of ask the question of what drives the differences between these sites? Like why do some have a good fit and some of them pretty much fail to match the soil moisture in the cumulative closure phase at all? Um, and we investigated a few possibilities um, for this difference between sites, um, including terrain and vegetation. So testing the impact of terrain on quality of fit, we find that the eastern side of our swath tends to have better estimates than the western side, and that pasture land tends to produce better estimates than grassland, which has better estimates than cropland. This may be because uneven irrigation patterns can complicate soil moisture signals in agricultural areas, or because vegetation growth and harvesting result in greater changes in moisture above the ground and therefore have a stronger effect on the closure phase signal. This is at C-band, so we expect it to be sensitive to vegetation in general. We can look at these vegetation signals from crop growth as a nu nuisance when we're trying to measure soil moisture, or we can again see this as an opportunity to learn more about vegetation alongside soil moisture. I'll get to that soon, um, but first a brief interlude to discuss something that's come up a few times, um, which is systematic bias. Uh, in this little interlude, I'll be discussing what causes the systematic bias that can show up in INSAR time series. Um, people will often see this looking like a constant uplift or subsidence that's like subtle but accumulates over time within your INSAR time series. Uh, and this is what shows up as a trend in the cumulative closure phase that makes us need to detrend it. So you recall our messy but straightforward model for closure phase. Again, don't worry too much about the math here. Uh, we'll return to this model to generate some example closure phases from modeled soil moisture time series. Um, and we're also going to use this simple model to look at some higher order effects of what happens if we tailor expand all of the exponentials in this equation. On the left, we have a closure phase time series simulation generated by soil moisture, where again, wetting occurs rapidly like rainfall and drying down happens slowly. When we estimate closure phase using the exponential model from the previous slide, the simulation produces spikes in the closure phase that result in a positive bias. And then the cumulative closure phase has a positive trend. <laughs> 
If we take the Taylor expansion of all the exponentials, and if we only look at the linear component, the closure phase is zero and there's no trend. So in, in plots two and three, this red line, that's just the linear component from the first order approximation, it's flat. Um, in other words, the linear parts cancel out and closure phase is entirely produced by the nonlinear components of this signal. Um, and so a second order approximation um, to these exponentials is able to capture this nonlinear component. Then we can say it's this nonlinear response to uneven rates of wetting and drying that causes the trend in cumulative closure phase and the systematic bias that comes from moisture in INSAR time series. On the left, we see that rapid wetting and slow drying can lead to an increasing trend with both a triangle-shaped and sign-shaped function. Uh, in the middle, symmetric wetting and drying, whether you use a triangle or a sign function just for two different shapes of possible uh, wetting and drying, they both lead to non-zero closure phase in individual triplets, uh, but they don't lead to this long-term bias. And then on the right, rapid drying and slow wetting lead to a decreasing trend in the cumulative closure phase. Well, rain doesn't usually behave like that. Um, like it doesn't usually rain over the period of the month and then all dry out in a day. Um, you could imagine water content in vegetation slowly increasing as the vegetation grows and then more rapidly decreasing in the event of a harvest or like an autumn leaf fall. Considering this general pattern, uh, we can look at the slope of the closure phase for different degrees of asymmetry between increasing moisture and decreasing moisture in our simulation. Generally, a more asymmetric time series leads to a larger trend in the cumulative closure phase and a larger like unevenness or what people call systematic bias in the closure phase. Um, of course, it's not exactly like linear here, but it points to a general rule of thumb that asymmetric wetting and drying fed into the nonlinearity of the closure phase produces a bias or trend. Okay, now let's return to the topic of vegetation moisture. If signals from vegetation moisture are interfering with our soil moisture signal, does that mean that we can measure vegetation moisture as well? If so, we could use this information to track wildfire fuel moisture or changes in water content from crop growth, for example. We can model the bulk dielectric constant of the vegetation in air as a function of the vegetation moisture content using a four-phase model from Ulibi and Jedlicka. Then we can calculate the closure phase according to our same simple scattering model and find the cumulative sum of the closure phase time series. We compare this to the ground truth canopy moisture averaged across the three time steps in each triplet. What we find is that the canopy moisture and cumulative closure phase can be very well correlated with a correlation coefficient in this example of 0.96. In our vegetation examples, we generally don't have um, a long enough time series of validation data um, with ups and downs um, to capture the increases and decreases of um, moisture and get and find the closure phase trend. Um, so because our time series are shorter, we usually skip the detrend step. Using the correlation between cumulative closure phase and canopy moisture, uh, we can regress them against each other and use this regression line to generate an estimate for canopy moisture from cumulative closure phase. Here, the estimated canopy moisture is a fairly decent match for the true signal. Uh, let's see how well this works using some real data. We now travel to a study area in the Harvard Forest in central Massachusetts, a temperate deciduous forest dominated by red oak. The average summer temperature during the months of data collection was 17.9 degrees Celsius, and the annual precipitation in the region averages about 100 centimeters with no strong seasonality. We'll look at two different validation sites in the Harvard Forest from two different SMAPVEX validation campaigns. 
Uh, both campaigns measured soil moisture and tree dielectric constant, as well as a few other different quantities. At our first site, the SMABFEX campaign collected in situ measurements of surface soil moisture, tree xylem dielectric constant, vegetation optical depth at L band measured from a tower, and canopy wetness over the summer of 2019. We generate a time series of sequential closure phases using a Sentinel-1 swath over the area, multi-look to a 300 meter pixel size. When we compare cumulative closure phase to the four kinds of in situ measurements, we find that the dielectric constant of the tree xylem does indeed have a very strong correspondence with closure phase. The correlation coefficient is 0.92 with a p-value of 0 0.001. Moreover, at this site, the soil moisture has no statistically significant relationship to the closure phase, suggesting that closure phase in this thick forest is produced more by canopy phenomena than soil phenomena. Likewise, we can see that canopy wetness appears anti-correlated with closure phase. Interestingly, Changing L-band vegetation optical depth measured from a tower above the trees also does not have a statistically significant relationship with C-band closure phase. When we regress each variable against the cumulative closure phase, we can make an estimate for each. We find that cumulative closure phase can be used as an estimator for vegetation dielectric constant and for canopy wetness here, but it does a poor job estimating soil moisture and L-band vegetation optical depth. This suggests that in dense forests, the closure phase at C-band can be used to measure moisture levels in the tree canopy and may not detect the ground at all. It also set shows that L-band and C-band are seeing very different phenomena, which suggests to me that a multi-wavelength analysis of forest could be valuable in the future, especially as, um, ESA and NASA slash ISRO are both planning to launch L-band uh, INSAR satellites. Um, I find these results very interesting because they show that in some places, the vegetation can really dominate the closure phase signal. Here, soil moisture and xylem dielectric constant are uncorrelated, and closure phase is far more related to the canopy variables than to the soil. Uh, but of course, this is one data point over one summer, and it would be nice to know how much this data generalizes. So let's look at a longer time series in another location where soil moisture may have more of an impact. For this site, uh, site data, I would like to thank the SMAPVEX team who generously shared their data pre-publication with me. They collected similar but slightly different in situ data to the previous study I showed in a part of the Harvard forest about 17 kilometers south of the first site. In situ soil moisture, real and imaginary parts of soil dielectric, and real part of vegetation dielectric constant in the trees. We performed the same set of steps to calculate cumulative closure phase and spatially averaged to a 300 meter pixel size. Then we compare the cumulative closure phase and in situ measurements. Here, soil moisture and vegetation dielectric are correlated with each other, with a statistically significant correlation of 0.7. And here we find that cumulative closure phase exhibits positive correlations with all four measured variables. Interestingly, it seems most aligned with the imaginary part of the soil dielectric constant. The reason for this is likely that the imaginary part of the dielectric constant controls how lossy a material is, and therefore it has an outsized impact on which layers we're seeing in our closure phase signal. With this set of variables too, we can regress the in situ data against cumulative closure phase and make estimates for each variable from the cumulative closure phase. We find that the closure phase does a reasonable job estimating soil dielectric pro properties and a poorer job estimating vegetation dielectric properties, following the trend but missing the extremes. <laughs> 
When we calculate a partial correlation between cumulative closure phase and vegetation dielectric controlling for soil moisture, we find no significant correlation. When we instead partially correlate cumulative closure phase with soil moisture, controlling now for vegetation dielectric, we find a statistically significant correlation of 0.53. Um, it may be that the closure phase arises from the soil moisture directly or from vegetation signals that are controlled by the soil moisture. Either way, I would categorize this location as soil dominant, where the closure phase is driven primarily by soil behavior. So now we can imagine a spectrum of contributors to closure phase, where some areas with dense or rapidly changing vegetation may have vegetation as the primary contributor to closure phase, while others with thinner vegetation or vegetation whose changes are slow or whose changes follow the soil moisture would have soil moisture as the primary contributor to closure phase. While both of these sites are within the Harvard forest and have similar summer NDVI values, the land cover differed within the radar pixel. The more vegetation dominant location here corresponds to mixed evergreen and deciduous land cover types, while the more soil dominant location was an almost entirely deciduous forest. So it may be the case that our Oklahoma soil data set, where we unfortunately don't have any vegetation validation data, um, it may be the case that there, pasture land is more soil dominated, which is why we have strong correlations to soil moisture and pasture, while agricultural land may be more vegetation dominated rather than soil dominated. Uh, and so if we did get vegetation validation data, we may see that the closure phase is tracking that more than the soil. In the future, we may be able to categorize land by the dominant scatterer type, um, either using additional data such as coherence, polarimetry, or land cover, or else with statistics of the closure phase itself, um, and try to use that to figure out what we're characterizing with the closure phase in each place. Um, and we could also try to with auxiliary data or with the closure phase, um, try to retrieve both vegetation and soil moisture. Um, and so next I'll show some, some preliminary work toward that. Um, now we're going to look at some vegetation fuel moisture sensors over Mount Diablo in California in the US, um, along with a soil moisture sensor there. Mount Diablo has a chaparral ecosystem, and we looked at soil moisture from an in situ sensor in a NOAA network that took measurements every 10 minutes starting in 2014. Um, nearby was a location where the Forest Service took periodic fuel moisture measurements biweekly in the warmer seasons with gaps in the winter starting in 2009. There was also a UAV SAR time series over Mount Diablo starting in 2009, um, which shows what we can find with L-band data over this area. Here's a video of the cumulative closure phase time series from this UAV SAR swath um, over Mount Diablo. We multi-looked to 50 meter pixels before computing the closure phase and processed with an additional 9x9 spatial filter over the closure phase image. The UAV SAR time series ran from 2009 to 2023. As you watch this video, think of places with more color as experiencing more moisture change over time. This is especially noticeable here in shorelines and islands, which may become very saturated in the wet season and then dry out more slowly. So again, we're thinking about that unevenness in wetting and drying. Um, remember, there's no deformation in this image since this is cumulative closure phase. Um, and so now we can look at how this compares to the validation data of old and new growth fuel moisture and 10 and 15 centimeter soil moisture. When we compare the closure phase at our in situ site to the validation data and try to estimate closure phase from each variable individually, uh, none of the individual in situ variables seem to singularly determine closure phase. So it would be hard to say this is vegetation dominated or soil dominated. Um, 
but maybe the closure phase is produced by a combination of these factors. Um, and so we'll take one soil variable and one vegetation variable um, and linearly combine them to see if we can estimate the soil moisture, or, or sorry, estimate the closure phase. Uh, and you can see on the left that a linear combination of the 10 centimeter soil moisture and the old growth fuel moisture can reproduce the cumulative closure phase. Uh, we still have a strong correlation um, of 0.9 and a relatively low RMSE of 0.1 radians. Um, so it seems that closure phase here in this site can be produced by a combination of soil and fuel moisture, even if neither one looks to particularly dominate the signal. Um, but what we're missing most often in the field is measurements of fuel or vegetation moisture. There is not much validation data of vegetation moisture out there. Um, so it would also be interesting to ask in this data set whether we can derive the fuel moisture from the INSAR data if we assume that we can supplement it with the in situ soil moisture. Um, so now we're going to instead do a multiple regression of closure phase and in situ soil moisture to estimate fuel moisture. And we find very strong results with correlation coefficients of 0.97 and 0.98 and low RMSE relative to the magnitude of fuel moisture. This tells us that we may be able to find fuel moisture with INSAR supplemented with in situ soil moisture, um, which is a much easier and more common thing that there's way more sensors out there doing that compared to fuel moisture. Next, let's see whether this regression derived from this UAV SAR swath um, can transfer um, and be used in a different UAV SAR time series over the same site. This UAV SAR time series is from a swath with the opposite heading but contains the same Clayton Ranch validation site. Uh, we'll try using the same regression equations used in the previous slide to estimate fuel moisture from UAV SAR and from in situ soil moisture. Um, and again, here places with um, more color blotches uh, generally indicate more moisture change. Um, and it's looking like um, in this swath, it's occurring in places with lots of vegetation. Using the same regression relationship derived from the other UAV SAR swath, uh, we can find very accurate estimates of fuel moisture with correlation coefficients of 0.96 and RMSE of 5% moisture for old growth and 15% for new growth. This is a promising sign toward being able to measure fuel moisture without needing to make intensive in-person measurements, uh, which has limited validation in the past. Soil moisture sensors are much more common, while fuel moisture measurements can be intensive and thin on the ground. So being able to measure fuel moisture from just in situ soil moisture plus in SAR closure phase is an exciting step. In the future, it would be great to work toward being able to invert both fuel and soil moisture. Um, there are many resources available that I'm starting to explore, including multiple frequencies, multiple polarizations, um, incorporating radar amplitude or in-star coherence, or other data sources and sensors. Um, but fine resolution measurements of both soil and vegetation moisture would be powerful for agriculture, for ecology, and for wildfire fuel management. Before we get to the final conclusions, here are a few takeaways that I hope are useful to at least someone watching this presentation. For those who work on INSAR, when you see bias from non-zero closure phase that is contaminating your INSAR deformation time series, think about it arising from moisture or other changing scatters in the area. And then when you see systematic bias that looks like a consistent uplift or a consistent um, subsidence over your study area, think about it happening from wetting and drying occurring at uneven rates. If you're someone who measures soil moisture, whether you use SMAP, SAR polarimetry, backscatter, or something else, um, there's a new source of potentially like 
more data on the table, essentially, which is this new source of active radar data that uses the interferometric phase, the closure phase, to measure soil moisture. Similarly, if you're looking to remotely track vegetation or fuel moisture, um, early results suggest this is one way to do it. Um, and finally, if you collect in situ measurements, I appreciate you. There aren't too many validation data sets that measure vegetation and soil moisture in the same location. Um, so these are really valuable and I would love to have more of them. So in conclusion, we've shown with our model that non-zero closure phase can result from interference of a surface and scatterers at depth such as varying soil and vegetation moisture with time. Cumulative closure phase can be used to estimate soil and vegetation moisture, and the dominant scatterer varies by area. There are places, probably most places, both have some amount of contribution to the closure phase signal. This method could yield soil moisture at finer resolution than is possible using radiometric remote sensing, opening up new possibilities for high resolution sense remote sensing of vegetation and soil moisture, um, especially because there's not like a radar product that's measuring explicitly vegetation moisture that I'm aware of, though feel free to correct me. Um, and if you're curious to read more about cumulative closure phase applied to measuring soil moisture, I encourage you to check out my paper linked in the QR code. Thank you so much for your time. I'm happy to take any questions and please feel free to reach out as well. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for your presentation. So let's start the Q&A with a few questions that we currently have in the chat. Uh, again, just as a quick note, if the audience has any questions, we ask that you please put them in the chat. Um, so while we wait for more questions to come in, let's start with the first question sent to us. Does the model consider phase unwrapping? Um, no, so we are not unwrapping phases here. And the reason for that is that the closure phases are usually tiny um, or really small even compared to like pi and minus pi. So what you'll notice in this image is the interferometric phase goes around the full cycle of like minus pi to pi. And so you would need to unwrap this. Um, but the closure phase signal is a lot smaller and more subtle. So within this image, it's mostly less than like 0.3 radians. Um, and so we don't unwrap the phases because they're so small. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, the second question we received, how do you differentiate between different type of soil spectra? Do you use any specific algorithms for this purpose? Soil spectra? Yeah, Meaning... I mean, it's not... Um, Different this... type of soil spectra. So perhaps it means different types of soil, um, right, either like... saturation or reflectivity. Yeah. Yeah. So for soil types, um, because we're sort of doing this in a time series, um, we we sort of like our model just used a soil type that was essentially an average of a bunch of different types of soil from um, Ulibi's paper. Um, but soil type generally isn't changing over time. Um, and so within a location, um, we just consider that most of the scattering change comes from moisture change. Um, we will need to think about though, as we start thinking about like generalizing our model to other locations with different soil types. Um, but because this is sort of time series based, um, we assume that the, the change over time in any given location is due to change in moisture rather than change in soil type. I hope that addresses the question. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question, so is five centimeter in C2 sufficient depth measurement for the associated SAR signal? Uh, could the Sentinel-1 potentially reach deeper depending on the soil type? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a great question. And that's sort of like, a lot of this work is ultimately constrained by the validation data. Like it's likely that when the soil is fully saturated with water, the Sentinel-1 wave isn't even penetrating all the way to five centimeters. And then if you're in a place that's very, very dry, um, the Sentinel-1 signal is likely reaching deeper than five centimeters. Um, 
in an ideal world, I would have, you know, infinite validation measurements of soil moisture at every depth and of vegetation moisture of every type. Um, I think that five centimeters is generally pretty reasonable for an average of what the Sentinel-1 satellite is seeing. C-band doesn't penetrate very deep into water, um, probably not more than a few centimeters if it's really wet, but um, of course this is an approximation. Okay, great. We got several questions on this. So have you analyzed the relationship between surface roughness with the closure phase? And I'll add on to this sort of combined other questions. Have you tried decoupling the measurement based on cover type, slope, aspect, um, again, surface roughness characteristics? Yeah, those are all things that I think like are really promising for future work. And I'm sort of um, starting to look at taking all these like, um, what's the word, like additional measurements that could like augment or help this. Um, and so I haven't looked at surface roughness yet, um, but I do think it would be really interesting to look at in the future, um, definitely. Okay, uh, along the lines of measurements, you know, what soil moisture probes were used, if you know, and what protocol was used for sampling the site, number of measurements, locations, distribution of location. Right, so in Oklahoma, um, there are, I was using a network of permanent soil moisture stations um, that are called the Oklahoma Mesonet. Um, and so they have permanently installed sensors there. Um, they use, um, in Oklahoma, they use thermal measurements, um, which heat up the soil and then uh, measure how long it takes for the soil to return to the initial temperature um, as a way to measure soil moisture. Um, in the um, the SMAPVEX data, I think they were using um, hydrosense probes, which measure the dielectric of the soil. Um, and the, the protocols, um, I'm citing it here. So if you ask this question, you can take a little um, screenshot. They're detailed in this validation data. And then there's, there's tons of uh, information available online about the Oklahoma Mesonet and how they use their protocols. Great. Okay, another question. So since Sentinel is operating uh, at 5.4 gigahertz frequency, how would the growing vegetation affect the interferogram and the soil moisture estimate? Um, I think that I think that because uh, Sentinel is operating at this frequency, um, that means it's sensitive to vegetation. And so I think that the growing vegetation is very likely to affect the soil moisture estimate. Um, and I don't know, was this asked recently or at the? Uh, it's sort of in the, in the middle. Yeah. OK. Um, hopefully, hopefully some of the later stuff kind of yeah. answers that as we try to explore vegetation. But if you have any open questions, feel free to pop those in the chat. No, I, I think the later part did answer that. <laughs> OK, um, let's see. Great work, Sentinel-1 data, dual polymetric. With can you say which polarization was used for soil moisture estimation? Yeah, I use the the copolarization, the VV for Sentinel One. Okay, great. Uh, do you know any any resources available as tutorials to calculate the closure phase? Any software or language that you recommend? Um, I don't know of any software tools that currently exist. Um. Once I get something sort of uh, fully worked out in terms of a flow, I would love to throw it up on GitHub. Um, but right now, there's just mostly papers that you can follow. Um, you can try following my paper um, that I published earlier this year. If it's confusing, feel free to email me. Francesca Dazan also has, um, and um, Simon Zweibach, they both have papers that discuss the estimations, but I don't know of any software that's calculating closure phase that's public yet. Okay, uh, let's see, we have two more questions. So how does increasing or decreasing multi-looking factors using interferograms affect the estimated soil moisture? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, increasing multi-looking uh, improves the estimates up to a point. And honestly, to a point like more multi-looking went 
improved the signal for longer than I anticipated. Like I thought that once you got much larger than an agricultural field, you would start to have the heterogeneities kind of dominate and it would decrease the quality of the signal. But it seems like you can sort of cover a few fields and still see improvements so they do get more modest. Um, and this is an aggregate. There are definitely some places where less multi-looking performed better. Um, and my best guess is these areas are more heterogeneous where you have soil moisture in one plot that is really different from soil moisture in the next door plot. Um, and so there, there's a trade-off in, in multi-looking. I have generally found that 50 by 20 looks is roughly a sweet spot in the places that I've looked. Um, but yeah, it probably varies by your location. Okay. Um, the, this question, I'm sort of combining, and we might have answered this, but how would you separate this vegetation growth from soil moisture contribution? And similarly, how would you differentiate between deformation signals? Right. So deformation signals are canceled out when you calculate the closure phase by design. Deformation signals are like linear, closure phase is nonlinear. That's one way to think about it. You don't have to worry about deformation. How would you separate vegetation and soil within this signal um, is a question that has a more complex answer. Um, and I've sort of alluded to some of the things I'm like looking at to separate them, right? Because there are times when vegetation and soil are correlated. There are times when Soil moisture seems to dominate the closure phase. There are times when vegetation moisture seems to dominate. I think that having just measurements of more things, whether you have, you combine maybe your C band from Sentinel with L band from future missions like NYSAR and Rose L, that's one way. I've done some looking at combining polarizations and I think there could be something there. Um, you could also try to figure out like using radar amplitude, um, and you could try to just figure out a way to characterize, okay, this spot has really dense and rapidly changing vegetation. So we're probably seeing vegetation changes in this forest. But then in this, you know, desert in Death Valley, we're probably mostly seeing soil moisture changes because there's not really any vegetation at all. Um, Great. And in the spirit of, you know, looking at other data sets, what about comparing your results with the SWIR from multispectral data? It may help to understand vegetation wire content variation in a variety of conditions. Yeah, I think that would be really interesting. Um, I haven't I haven't done the comparisons with optical data yet. Um, but I do I do think that would be interesting. Um, and I think, you know, there's there's some power to supplement one data set with another where, you know, the closure phase is sort of a relative time series that tracks change, whereas the SWIR may have more absolute measurements. But at the same time, like the INSAR can see through clouds so you can access places that it would be much harder to see with optical during certain seasons. Uh, so I think that would be really um, interesting to look at as well. OK, great. Uh, do you think closure phase could also be useful to track snow accumulation and or wetness? Yes, I do. Um, I think that, you know, you're probably likely to, uh, like, run into similar things where, you know, if the snow is wet, that's going to, like, be a much larger um, change in the signal than just like accumulating another inch of dry snow. Um, but I do think that the closure phase, you know, it's the same kind of multi-layer phenomena. Um, so I absolutely think there's potential. And I think that would be really interesting to look at for snow. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited by that as well. Uh, <laughs> how could we identify whether the non-zero clo closure phase is induced by moisture change or noise? Yeah, I think that um, one thing that I've I've found here is like a lot of multi-looking makes this signal um, emerge. And if if you don't do much multi-looking, if you do like five by two looks on Sentinel, you're really, you're really dominated by noise. Um, and so I think just having more validation data would help us scope out exactly how much of it is noise and exactly how much of it is signal from moisture change. Um, yeah, I do think that's kind of an open question, though. You're always battling the noise, and it is a, it is a very noisy signal. Okay, great. Uh, 
Uh, is there a significant difference in accuracy applying the method for low biomass uh, cropland, high biomass forest? Right. I, I guess you, you get some hint of this. I think the forest is definitely more complex. Um, using Sentinel over some of the cropland, though, like you can see that even with the kind of low biomass cropland, that's not a guarantee of a good signal. Um, and I think that what is possibly the cause of that is that there's a lot more vegetation change in the cropland where the changes in vegetation in the forest, you know, it's more consistent. The trees are staying trees over seasons rather than growing and being harvested. Um, so yeah, I mean, I will be frank, I got much better results out of the forest than I had mm -hmm imagined was likely just given the amount of noise and biomass and everything. But I, I do think that this method has promise in the forest, like mm -hmm. um, this correlation between the tree dielectric and the, the cumulative closure phase was to me pretty surprisingly good. So I, mm -hmm. I think there's promise there even with the high biomass, I guess. <laughs> Great. Well, we are out of time. Uh, I'll ask one last quick question. You know, is the model available for use by others? Uh, if not, when? Um, yeah, the model is available. Um, there are mathematical details of it in the paper that I published um, earlier this spring. Um, there's not code for the model, but it is just a set of equations. So it is not too hard, hopefully, to code up yourself. Uh, maybe I'll uh, release it on GitHub at some point if I if I write a version that's a bit cleaner. Um, but yeah, you're welcome to try implementing it yourself from the paper. Well, great. Thank you so much for your time, Elizabeth. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, that, that concludes our webinar for today. Thanks for hosting, Sean.